Dennis Sarfate making his first appearance. What will you do to defend the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Welcome to the Green Dragon Tavern, where we talk a little treason. I'm Zach Lautenschlager. And I'm Dennis Sarfate. Joining us today is William Wolf. Uh, William is a friend of mine and a former um, Trump administration executive. Thanks for joining, William. Good to be back here with you guys. So we uh, are opening the discussion on um, what about Trump? Can Christians uh, vote for Trump would be how one side would say it. Maybe the other side would say, can Christians not vote for Trump? Um, as someone who's worked in politics professionally for 27 years and who ran a large gun rights organization through Trump's administration, there are many things that I like about him. There are some things I dislike about him. Um, which is true of Ronald Reagan as well. Uh, it's true of George Washington for me. Um, and so uh, it's always a good discussion. Uh, William is, uh, I believe, on the uh, supporting Trump side, and, unless I've read you wrong, William. And so we wanted to have you on and give you the opportunity to, uh, to, to address that question. Can Christians vote for Trump? Yeah, I think the answer to that is a very clear yes. Just when you're putting it conditionally like that, can Christians vote for Trump? I think that you know, a vote is an exercise of stewardship that needs to be wielded with wisdom. I believe that Christians should vote um, in order to steward the political gifts and talents God has given us in this country and to participate in our representative government, which is very unique and special in the history of of mankind and the freedoms that we have enjoyed here and we get to advance those further through the voting process so first of all i think christians should vote they should vote to love their neighbors and they should vote to seek justice and they should vote fundamentally for the policy platform that the president of the united states is running on because the president of the united states is the chief executive officer of all of the you know executive branch that third branch of government and unfortunately, in American politics, we've turned the presidential race into a very personality driven contest when what matters most is how that chief executive officer is directing literally the tens of thousands of bureaucrats who are managing your tax dollars at the federal level. And the policies that I saw from Trump in the first administration and the ones that he's proposed to do in a second administration, I think are largely good and wise and just uses of the tax dollars that we send to the federal government to run this country. So I absolutely do think that Christians can vote for Trump. You know, in 2020, I actually, I took it a step further. I said, if you are a Christian and you don't vote for Trump, then I, I question your, your ability as a Christian to see things like when, when one party and just take abortion, right? When one party is for killing babies and the other party, even though I don't agree with Trump or what he said recently about there should be a 15 week ban or 20 week, I think he's wrong on that. But one party stands for death and is going to take away those rights to even fight the abortion fight. Um, every Christian should vote for Trump. I, I, I probably a lot different than Zach. Um, would I vote for DeSantis if he was going against Trump in a um, primary? That would be, a, it'd be hard. But, you know, I know Trump did a lot of great things. He did some things that were bad. But as a Christian, I could never vote for the other guy, the other party. And then as a Christian, if I don't vote, then I'm just giving them that vote. And so I really think, like you said, the Christians have an obligation and a duty to vote and to vote the correct way, which I would say is in this next election is voting for Trump. And I think if you don't vote for Trump, then there's some issues there. Well, I think that that is an accurate statement. I think the one thing that I do differ on is to recognize that Christians are obligated to participate. In fact, we're obligated to be uh, aware and paying attention and taking part and influencing because we are responsible before God for what our government does. Mm -hmm. um, we are responsible for what our government does. We are not free to sit back and say, well, you know, we lose here anyway. And, you know, if the federal government does something I don't like, that's not my problem. That is not true. I love the religious right. And I think that they were, uh, they're essentially batting a thousand on their predictions of what would happen to our country that people laughed at. The slippery slope is real and we are accelerating down it at an increasing uh, rate of trajectory towards, I think, the destruction of our country, ultimately the efforts to undo the, or try to undo things like 
the fixed nature of biology. And, you know, D Dennis mentioned this, that the Democrats are the party of abortion. They're the party of death. Uh, I've put it like this before. If Democrats can't abort your baby in the womb, they're going to trans your kid when they get out of it. And if they can't trans their kid, they're going to indoctrinate them in the public in, through the public school system. But either way, they're coming for your kids. And I think that, you know, I was trying to give a pretty measured answer to can Christians vote for Donald Trump, which I think they can. But to the question of whether or not should Christians vote for Donald Trump, I would aggressively say, yes, I think they should, because it is the most effective vote that you can cast in America today to try to stop the utter you know, encroachment of evil upon our country. It's not just a one issue scenario anymore with abortion. We've got a wide open border. We've got a president who's leading us into um, endless wars around the world and counterproductive engagements. You know, uh, being pro-life means being against abortion, yes, but being pro-life includes having reasonable leaders in the foreign policy sphere who are going to avoid a nuclear holocaust. And there's no one else I trust more to lead us on the national stage than Donald Trump. That's actually one of the reasons why I was still for Trump, uh, uh, along with a host of reasons in the primary, is because I thought Donald Trump's foreign policy and his national security policy, which I got to play a part in, is the best foreign policy and national security policy we've seen in our country for decades. And I'd love to have that steady hand uh, back in the White House. And he's already talked about taking on transgenderism. He'd sign a bill to ban it, uh, ban gender reassignment surgery in all 50 states. He'll remove federal funding from hospitals who perform gender transition surgeries. He'll cut off federal funding from schools that promote radical gender ideology and push pornography on kids in the classroom. And so, I mean, it's not just one issue. I just listed a couple, but across the board, from all the cultural issues to national security policy to economic policy, I, I, Trump is head and shoulders above Biden. David French today made a comment as if he thought that Biden's not that bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, French. Biden is that bad. I couldn't agree more with you there. And there mm -hmm. is no question now that we are, for all practical purposes, through the primary season, presidentially speaking. Um, yeah, there's you can't. I, I will say without hesitation, you cannot be a Christian and vote for Biden. I'm sorry. You cannot, with mm -hmm. a straight face, say, I believe in what the Bible says and I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. That is laughable. That is absolutely laughable. Um, and for the reasons you mentioned, especially Trump's foreign policy, I agree. I couldn't agree more. Trump's foreign policy and most of his domestic policy was fantastic. Um, that's why I say, look, for those who, who have made up their mind and said, look, I am obviously not going to vote for Biden and I am going to vote for Trump because the option is to not vote. I respect that. I see that. I recognize it. And I think that that is a valid biblical choice. Um, but I think that what has to be wrestled with, we are actually given a minimum standard for elective office. And it's not thou must be pro-life. It's not thou must have a good foreign policy. It, it's none of those questions. It's do you love justice? Do you uh, love righteousness. For me, in 2020, we had Christians literally saying, I can't vote for a guy who, who talks like this, right? His, his Twitter handle and this and that. We went to this side of, because the media was against Trump on every angle, every news outlet was against Trump. And so you never really talked about, well, let's talk about the Democratic Party, right? Let's talk about the things that they do that are, have a, a different morality than Christians would stand for. But it just always seemed like the housewives would turn on Trump, like, oh, the things he said in the past. And it's like, do we not think that Biden said these same exact things in a closed room of a clubhouse of a golf course? Like, can we be real here? I played baseball for 21 years. The things I heard in a clubhouse from Christian, claiming Christian men, uh, atheist men were pretty much on par with each other. So the morality thing is like, I can't vote for Trump because I just feel like, I just, I don't want to vote at all. And for my thing, I, I get the saying is you have a, a God given right to not vote, but when you don't vote as a Christian for Trump, you're giving your vote to the other side because the other side doesn't care about the morality of their president. They just want to vote for anything against the Republicans, right? And conservatives. So you're, you're not, you not voting is giving them another vote. And I think that's what happened a lot in 2020. I could be wrong. I still don't think Trump lost in 2020. But I think a lot of that was Christians saying, I can't vote for him, so I'm just not going to vote, which I think is, okay, well, you just voted for the other party. John Piper came out with a thing where he didn't really say he wasn't going to vote for Trump, but he also pushed a lot of people to vote 
or to not vote because of the dilemma in the morality side of things. And I think that's dangerous. Yeah, well, you bring up a couple of good points that I would love to address. And so I'll take the first one on like the tone. And that's that, you know, we live in a, a hyper emotional and feminized age where mm -hmm. we are conditioned to respond primarily to how things are said, not necessarily what's being said. And, and so and, and then Christians in particular, because they're manipulated by this uh, sort of empathy driven sabotage, which Joe Rigney talks about quite a bit, they've internalized their voting into something that they want to feel pious and righteous about. Now, I agree with Zach. There are God given standards for righteousness that we should evaluate. But at the end mm -hmm. of the day, when you walk in and out of a voting booth, the way you should be filtering that question is not through how does this make me feel or how do I even feel about how the tone this guy uses? It needs to be the policies right. that mm -hmm. are on the docket there. And so that's the first one is stop voting about how it makes you feel. Get out of your heart and use your head and use your scripture and look at the platform. And then the second thing on this too is a, a disordered moral hierarchy. So yes, I remember that Piper piece. And again, even if we were to assume, you know, say all the things Trump said are really as bad as people like to make them out to be, or as Christians, they're really mm -hmm. that morally repugnant. Do you know what is more evil, far more morally repugnant and far worse in the eyes of God and any man who's reasoning rightly is abortion on demand through all nine months, is mutilating our children in sacrifice of the, the false god of radical transgender ideology, and, and is pushing the other divisive ideologies, critical race theory, DEI. You know, there's a new form of racism that's sweeping across our country in the guy, under the guise of bureaucrats and HR departments. I mean, and all these things are just far greater, truly greater moral evil. So when Piper tried to compare Trump's uh, disposition to Biden's policies, that is a categorical confusion, and Christians need to reject It's that. absolutely silly, and I mm -hmm. couldn't agree more. I think the argument in 2020, the arguments put forward, that we can't vote for Trump because mean tweets, which is basically what they all boil down to, were absurd. I can understand people now saying, well, Trump is backpedaling on Roe. He's backpedaling on, and he's actually pushing for the Alabama um, IVF problem bill. And he's making overtures to the homosexuals, okay? Look, I'm sympathetic to my brothers who bring those things forward. I'm not saying that they're right. I'm not sure that they are, to be honest. Um, but I think that if we, we have to do, and this is what you've already done, William, acknowledge that, well, yes, there is a principial issue here, and you have to make a principial decision. I couldn't agree more. I think that that is the core of the decision-making process, and it's more important than this election, unfortunately, and that's tough. Um, I realize that this is an important election, but I've worked in professional politics long enough to remember how many most important elections of our lifetimes we have lived through. Um, and so I, I think we do have to strike that balance, and I really appreciate the issues that you raise. I think that anyone who is considering not voting for Trump has to, is obligated to, consider the issues that you both are raising, uh, which are very valid. Yeah, well, to respond to that, Zach, I would say that, again, if I was, I don't work for the campaign, right? If I were advising Trump, if I had a seat at, you know, at the table in the room, I would counsel him differently on a lot right. of things. But I, I will, I want to remind everybody that Trump is a very unique creature, right? Oh, yeah. He was essentially a pretty moderate New York Democrat, before he mm -hmm. ran, Clinton donor. but what I, I've heard, <laughs> yeah. So, but what I, but tr what Trump has been incredibly consistent on is his love for this country and it and his love for the people of yeah, this country and his desire to see their flourishing. You go back and watch him on like Larry King in the 1980s, and the guy is making the exact same points about pro-American trade policy, pro-American international policy, mm -hmm. making other countries pay their fair share pro-American immigration policy. And immigration really is one of the most existential issues facing our nation right yeah. now. And that said, so, so, so on the cultural issues, Trump comes from that very unique background that's different from many Republican candidates. But I've heard many encouraging stories about how he is willing to listen and learn from the Christian advisors who's get his mm -hmm. ear. That's why he's been so strong on the Johnson Amendment. That's why he was so strong in appointing pro-life justices in the first term. Mm -hmm. and, at, and at the end of the day, too, I recognize that Trump has this feature where he, he talks to try to appeal to everybody he possibly oh, yeah. can. 
But at the end of the day, like there wasn't a single pro LGBT policy that was advanced under the Trump administration the first yeah, time. And I, I would be highly doubtful we would see a second one. And, and then the last point I make on this is Trump is a unique creature, but he's also part now of this larger culture of the right and Republicanism in America or the Republican Party. And brothers, they're just weak. Like, so we can fault Trump on supporting a 15, a 15 week abortion uh, ban bill. But the reality is, is 80 other 80 percent of the rest of our Republican representatives uh, support that, too. We can fault Trump on his. I'd say uh, higher than that. Higher than that. We can fault Trump on his positioning on IVF again, which I disagree with him. I disagree with the governor of Alabama. But we have so much work to do on that issue in our party at large. I think it would be inappropriate for Christians to hold Trump singularly responsible mm. for having a different mm. position on those issues than the than the vast majority of our Republican Party does, which shows us how much work we have to do in general. I agree 100%. And, you know, for me, if, if Snoop Dogg changes his mind and now is for Trump, then I guess we should all be for Trump. <laughs> hey, Kid Rock was from the beginning. <laughs> That's so the one that did it. So, and, you know, and I think that it's important to recognize the context of this discussion. And I usually bring something that uh, that's a little bit irritating in that I am suspicious of all politicians. I have a deep, um, I have deep problems with Ronald Reagan. You can go back, and I mentioned it before. You can go back and look at George Washington's handling of the Whiskey Rebellion. You can look. We can critique Thomas Jefferson on the Louisiana Purchase. Um, pick one. We're, we're going to find problems. That's because all politicians are fallen sinful human beings, and when we're in the middle of a hot election, which is we are now there it becomes treason to say anything negative about your own side. And I think we need to be a little bit more robust than that and say, okay, there are problems, as you are being, uh, William, and say, okay, there may be difficulties here. Does that really mean that he doesn't, that this particular candidate doesn't measure up to the minimum standard? You're making the argument, no, you're making the argument very well. You're starting to convince me. Uh, and I, so I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the discussion. Yeah, thanks, Zach. You know, I, I think that you're right. There have been major issues with um, all presidents. I mean, we can look back at what Bush does and I th- what, you know, what W. Bush did. And I know. Right. But but also I would remind people that Trump is is a, is a winner. Right. He, he is a winner at the national level. He we were getting dusted. You know, Romney, McCain, McCain, oh, Romney, yeah. like we, the Republican Party at a national level was a loser. Also, this is fascinating. If you look at the demographics that are coming out of these exit polls during the primaries, yeah. Trump is remaking the Republican Party into a working class and actually more diverse party than we could have ever hoped to see under a Chamber of Commerce Republican, um, you know, r- regular run of the mill. So I- I'm actually very pleased that the Republican Party has changed pretty drastically to more of a MAGA America first party. And of course, there are, you know, there's issues on the fringes there with some things. But in general, that's a much better way, I think, for a a viable party for Christians to be oriented in America. And the the last thing I'll say, too, to really kind of help make this case, if you're sitting sitting on the fence here, uh, which is that I was at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention and I heard the Trump speech live where he he went like line after line about the way that Christians are under attack in America. And he proposed a ton of positive policies to try to protect our religious freedoms and our ability not just to worship freely in our churches and in our homes, but to live freely in the public squares according to our Christian values and our conscience and our beliefs. And I believe that there is an an increasing and obvious attack on Christianity in this country and a really coordinated effort to try to silence and, you know, and, and kind of demonize conservative Christians. And Trump is, I think, unapologetically willing to defend us and use the lever, lev, levers of power to do so rightly in this nation. And that, that gives me great hope, and it's something I want to see. Yes, that is another very valid argument. To look at the, the bigger picture, you do have to come away saying, well, you, you have a choice. And it's really, you don't have multiple choices anymore. This is not a multiple choice ballot anymore. Um, and so you'd have to make your choice. Now, this is the nature of, of presidential politics in the United States. Um, and so that's the way it works. I think there's one more thing that we want to leave with as we finish off this segment, and that is to recognize no nation, and especially not the United States, is made or broken on one presidential election. It is a series 
of uh, policies and motions, uh, political movements that change. Now, is this presidential election going to have an impact? Yes, it is. Is it going to be the one that makes or breaks America? No, it's not. It is sim- quite simply not going to be. Um, if Democrats do win in the fall, God forbid, um, it is going to be worse than it is now. It is going to get worse. Uh, if Republicans win, there will be things that get better. Those things are true, but we cannot hang our hopes on that. And as, as American conservatives, we love the silver bullet. We love to be able to do one thing and fix America, and that's it. It's not that simple. We have to be involved at a much deeper level, and that's the reverse side. I think we talked a little bit about the religious right. There's much about the religious right that I appreciate about Pratt Robertson, about Jerry Falwell, senior. Um, the problem is that our interpretation uh, as, as a whole, for the most part, on the conservative side, especially the Christian side, as well, as long as we vote, we've done our duty. That is not true. That is not true. And 2020 showed more clearly than ever that unless you are really holding your city government accountable, unless you're holding your school board accountable, unless you're holding your county government accountable, unless you are involved in your state politics, um, you are not doing your job as a Christian. And the nation, regardless of who's president, is going to have a very hard time of it. Much of the problem we face today economically, unfortunately, started with the panicked response of the Republican administration in the summer of 2020 to COVID. Um, So that's not a reason to vote against Trump. I'm not suggesting that it is. It is a reason to hold everyone accountable and to recognize that, great, presidential politics are there. That's a decision you need to make. And then you need to get back to work and take over your city and take over your county. All of us can actually do that. That's not even that hard. You just have to do it. Guys, thank you so much for your time today. William, really appreciate you joining. A pleasure as always. Thanks, William. Yeah, Zach, thanks for having me on. And, and I'll close with just saying this. I, I agree with you that we are in a generational fight. And the, the hope that we all have to come back to is that Christ is king. And he, he is the one who knows the future of this nation. And as Psalm 16 says, the boundary lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. It might not look pleasant right now. It might look worse later. Maybe it will look, it will look better, but the Lord is our shepherd and our king, and he will lead us to and through November and ultimately home to the promised Amen, land. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.